Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our online information and support session. More than three quarters of Canadians use complementary therapies and up to 80% of people living with cancer report having used some form of complementary therapy following their diagnosis. In fact, Canadians spend up to and close to $9 billion annually on this industry. My name is Kathleen Helgeson and I'm the coordinator of the Patient and Family Resource Centre and I'm joined today by Dr. Linda Belnaves, Associate Professor in the College of Nursing at the University of Manitoba, who's going to be sharing her knowledge and answering your questions about the options and evidence for complementary therapies. We are very pleased to offer this session with the generous funding support of the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting from all regions in Manitoba, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, and Dene people, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's important for us to foster inclusivity and reconciliation and encourage others to do the same. Before we continue, there are a few basic uh, Zoom features I'd like to explain. You'll notice as an attendee, your microphone and your video are turned off. If you have a question for Linda at any time during the session, just click on the Q&A icon on your screen and type your question. You can also choose to ask that question anonymously by checking the send anonymously box before you click the blue arrow to send. My coworker, Allie, is also here off screen and she will be helping manage your questions as they come in. If you have a technical concern, you can also ask Allie in the Q&A and she will answer your question privately and try to assist you. For the past 25 years, our guest speaker's research program has focused on the use of complementary therapies in the context of cancer. Since 2007, she's been the principal investigator for the Complementary Medicine Education Outcomes Research Program. She is currently the immediate past president of the Society for Integrative Oncology and a board member of INCAN the Canadian chapter of the International Society for Traditional, Complementary and Integrative Medicines. She is also the Deputy Director of the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids. Welcome, Linda. Thanks, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're really excited to learn more about complementary therapies and especially the research that you've been doing all these years. And I'm just curious, you started off your academic career in nursing. What drew you into the field of complementary medicine? There was a couple of things that drew me into it. I was very fortunate as an undergrad uh, nursing student to work as a research assistant. Uh, and every time I turned off the tape recorder after interviewing a patient or a family member, they would start asking me about all these various therapies like vitamin D or using a herbal remedy. And they would ask me if it was useful for them to use it and if it was safe. And I couldn't answer those questions because I hadn't learned about them in my nursing program and I, I really knew very little about it. Um, and it took me going into my master's program where I was actually on a, an outpatient chemo unit. Uh, and I had a patient that, you know, had finished her treatment and was, you know, walking out to the parking lot. And she just said, uh, I'll see you guys later. I'm off to see my chiropractor. My neck is killing me. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, just after she left, we, we found out that she actually had uh, bony metastases all the way into her neck region. Uh, and I realized that there was a real risk here that if she went and had her neck manipulated, uh, she could end up with a, a very serious injury. Um, and so uh, I realized that we hadn't asked her about her use of these therapies. We hadn't charted who her chiropractor was. Uh, and fortunately, she decided to go home immediately after her treatment because she wasn't feeling well. But it, it really, um, as a master's student, it made me realize we need to be focusing on this. We need to be talking to patients about it. We need to understand the risks attached to it. And we need to know which therapies could actually be useful for patients and, and have that dialogue. So uh, that's how I kind of ended up in this whole field. Wow, that's great. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, because we often see these terms used um, interchangeably, and I'm just wondering if it's just semantics, or is there a difference between saying complementary therapy as opposed to alternative therapy or integrative medicines, another term that we're hearing. So could yeah. you kind of explain the difference in those terms? Sure. And, and there actually is a real difference. And unfortunately, we see them being used interchangeably you know, all the way up to JAMA Oncology, one of the top ranking journals, uh, you know, in cancer care. Um, and complementary medicine is really referring to therapies, be they practices or products 
or processes that are not traditionally considered to be part of conventional medicine. Uh, they're often on, on the outskirts of it. They either haven't had sufficient training in them or we don't have sufficient evidence around them. Um, and so these complementary therapies are traditionally used alongside conventional cancer treatment. Alternative medicine though, is when people make the decision to not use chemotherapy perhaps or radiation or some other form of conventional medicine. And they choose to use these therapies as a replacement. Very few cancer patients actually do that. We have about three to 5% of patients in Canada that report using alternative medicine. There's obviously some concerns about it because especially if you have early stage, you know, curative disease, we really want people to stay where we have the best evidence and go through their conventional treatment. So there's, there's a great deal of concern, but it's very different than using it in a complementary sense. And then integrative medicine, it's something we don't see a lot of in Canada. It's more likely to be seen in the US where they actually have embedded an integrative oncology clinic into the actual um, cancer facility. And you see a very comprehensive care plan developed where patients can be referred to this clinic and they can receive counseling as well as therapies. And everyone's on the same page in terms of what therapies they're using. So you really avoid things like interactions between natural products and medications and people that are struggling with maybe some symptoms or side effects are getting some alternatives uh, that are shown to be evidence-based uh, and have been shown to be helpful. So um, that's the, kind of the difference between those three terms. Yeah. And, you know, the integrative clinic sounds like such a great idea. And yeah. why, why is that not happening here? I know I've heard from patients like yeah. that there should be something here at Cancer Care like that. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with just the structure of our healthcare system in Canada. Um, these are therapies that obviously cost money. Uh, and when we're in this kind of fiscally constrained healthcare system, you know, we often have to create some priorities. Uh, and given, you know, the paradigm that most, you know, physicians and nurses and pharmacists are trained in, in conventional medicine, that obviously, you know, and the evidence base as well, that becomes the priority. Uh, and, and it's hard, you know, to, to offer therapies as well, um, you know, when we have a, a system, you know, that is publicly funded, and most of these therapies are not covered in our provincial or territorial healthcare plans. Uh, so it would mean people would have to pay for it fee for service, uh, which really isn't supported in these publicly funded institutions. So we often see these clinics, you know, op offering uh, care kind of off the side in the community, but that means we, that we don't have this kind of cohesive conversation going on between, you know, complementary practitioners as well as conventional uh, healthcare providers. Right. Well, let's um, take a moment just to check in with our audience. Um, we'd like to hear from you in terms of what your goals and hopes are for this session. Um, so I'm just going to launch um, a poll to your screen. So you should be um, seeing a poll come up on your screen, and you can. Uh, just weigh in on, on what you'd like to see from today's session. So we'll just take a moment to, to look at that. We know that you might have different expectations, so take your time and just go ahead and report on um, any of them that you're interested in. Linda, I don't know if you can see the results coming in for that. I can. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Great. So we'll just uh, give it a few more seconds there, and then we can talk about those results. If you're not seeing a poll come up on your screen, it could just be that your computer doesn't support it. So um, if you have a, um, a comment you'd like to make, just send it into the Q and A, and Ali will relay that to me as well. Okay, so I think I'll probably end the polling there. We have about 80% of our people that have voted here, and I'll just share the results with you. Okay, are you seeing that, Linda? Yeah, I can, and it's, okay. it's not surprising to me. Uh, when we started the Cameo program, which was at the BC Cancer Agency uh, in Vancouver, you know, we said the top questions that patients had is, does it work and is it safe? And when people asked about, you know, does it work? It wasn't just about, you know, could this help, you know, cure my cancer or prevent a reoccurrence? It was also about, can it help me manage the side effects and symptoms I'm experiencing 
you know, from the cancer or from the treatment. So this is completely in line with the questions I've been hearing over the last 20 years uh, in great. my research program. Oh, great, great. Well, thank you. And, and we're hopefully we're going to be able to answer some of those questions for you today. Um, did you want to start with some of your slides, Linda? Sure, let me just jump right in. Um, so I'll just need to be able to share my slides. I don't know if you've given me that ability to share um, my screen. If you just go to the bottom there of your you screen, go. it's the share screen. Yeah, yeah, it should be there. And yeah, we're seeing your slides. You just, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you already know who I am. So, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other thing too about, you know, some people ask me, well, you know, why are you still in this field after so many years? And uh, we just did a study actually a couple of years ago um, where we actually surveyed people that were coming into Cancer Care Manitoba to receive care. These are people on active treatment as well as people moving into that sur survivorship uh, phase. Uh, and what we found out is that almost three quarters of, of people coming in are using some form of complementary therapy, which um, I think was reassuring to us because we, we'd love to start creating some programs here and, and, and some information programs. And it's really clear that, you know, most patients are probably either using or they're thinking about using these therapies. Uh, and we had a very large amount, uh, just over 71%, that said that they're also using natural products. That's things like vitamins, minerals, any type of biological supplement that you're consuming or perhaps consuming through another route into your body. Uh, and, and that's really important because I think when I talk to conventional healthcare providers, that's often their greatest concern uh, is people ingesting or consuming some type of a biological therapy where they're concerned it may interact with their treatments or that there may be some safety concerns around it. So this obviously raises the fact that we need to be having these conversations uh, with, with patients and survivors. You know, I was kind of surprised that, you know, under 10% of individuals were using mind-body therapies, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. There's actually a plethora of evidence, a lot of studies have been conducted on a variety of these types of therapies that really kind of focus on your psychological and, and, and you know, quality of life, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, so I was surprised that so few people were reporting using them at that time. And if you dive a little bit deeper into the slide, what you see is that the, you know, the natural health products, it's really the vitamin Ds, vitamin B, calcium, people are taking multivitamins, vitamin C, o omegas, you know, things that a lot of people I think are, are, are kind of grabbing from over the counter, uh, that there's been some dialogue that they may be useful in supporting your overall health, particularly vitamin D. Uh, in fact, we had the Canadian Cancer Society many years ago actually say that, you know, with us being up in the Northern Hemisphere and not getting enough sunlight, you know, taking up to, you know, 1200, you know, uh, international units of vitamin D uh, per day is very helpful. And there's been a lot of research that suggests it can play a role in preventing uh, certain types of cancer like colorectal, as well as breast cancer. It's interesting, like you said, that only 9% were using uh, mind-body therapies. And I'm wondering if that's a cultural uh, thing, whether in different um, countries you would see that shift a little bit or, yeah, or it would be interesting to know why people were skeptical that those could be helpful. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, what we found in Vancouver is that when we did an education program that talked more about it, we saw the rates go up. Wow. So it, it could have also been just maybe we had more people on active treatment. And at that time, they were more focused on just, you know, getting through treatments and not really thinking right now of how can I embed something like meditation or yoga uh, or a relaxation program into my, my treatment plan at this time. And, and we often see survivors uh, as being more likely to move into these types of programs later on. Good to know. Yeah. Um, the other thing I thought would be really interesting for us to talk about is just some of the top things to think about uh, if you're thinking of using complementary medicines or if you're kind of started down uh, this journey. And one question I always kind of get is, you know, what type of evidence should I use? And I often have, you know, individuals coming up to me and they're like, hey, look, this was in the paper. It was on the media. There's something about this therapy. And I say, well, it was done in, in mice or it was done in a test tube with, you know, cancer cells. Uh, and, and when I'm trying to, you know, share evidence about these therapies or give advice uh, or recommendations uh, to patients, 
I really want to focus on trials that have been done in humans. Uh, hopefully a randomized clinical trial that's very controlled so that we truly know if that therapy is, is working and if we see any effects, it's related to that therapy. Uh, and what we prefer is if we have several trials, we're able to look at things like a systematic review or a meta-analysis where we actually combine those studies together. And that really gives us the highest level, the most rigorous evidence you know, we can have the best, um, you know, confidence in that, that data from those types of, of studies. Um, and for those of you that are just like, you know, well, this, this is still cutting edge. Uh, I always encourage you to go on to something like clinicaltrials.gov, which is, a, a, it's a website that's in the United States, but they take uh, clinical trials from all around the world. Many Canadian trials are registered there. And you can actually see, you know, the latest research that's going on on a certain therapy, in what type of cancer it's going on and whether they've actually published the results uh, or not. And they sometimes will publish their results early on that website. So it, it's a great resource, but I guess what I'm recommending is that people really focus on those high quality studies. And if you're reading a, an article in the newspaper or online, make sure that it's actually been conducted uh, with humans. The other thing I think that's really important is to think about side effects. Um, and, you know, I, I, you sometimes hear people, not as much anymore, but when I first started say, well, you know, these are non-toxic, they're natural substances, you know, they don't have the same side effects as, as medications. And while often these therapies are not being used in large amounts and many will have minor side effects, I always remind uh, individuals that you're consuming a therapy, you know, or using a therapy because you're, you're planning on it having an effect. And in fact, many of the natural health products do have an impact on our bodies. And so I always say, if you're using, you know, a vitamin, a mineral, or especially a herbal remedy, that you'll want to think about this and maybe talk to your pharmacist about it, or, uh, you know, a dietitian about this, or go online. There's some great resources that I'm going to talk about to see if it could potentially, you know, thin your blood. A lot of things like garlic, willow bark, feverfew, they actually do thin your blood, which if you're going in for surgery can be problematic. You know, sometimes they impact our liver. They can also sometimes impact our kidney function. And again, if you're undergoing something like chemotherapy, you wanna make sure that those organs are functioning properly and aren't being impaired by another substance that you're taking. And, and because of that, sometimes they kind of, um, these natural health products can function through drug metabolism pathways in our body and it can impact how they're broken down. And, and a great example is St. John's wort that has some really strong evidence around mild and moderate depression. And a lot of people take it, but it can actually clear a lot of medications sooner than you want to. And especially if you're undergoing chemotherapy or perhaps a hormone therapy, you want it to be in the body as long as it's supposed to be. So it's again, a good opportunity to check with a pharmacist to make sure that you're not going to be impacting how a medication is functioning in your body. And if you're going for blood tests, something like ginseng can impact your blood sugar level. So you wanna double check. Uh, and if you're going in for a lab test, make sure you tell them what you're taking or maybe have a conversation about having a washout period so you're getting accurate lab uh, results. And you know, if you're a person that has hay fever, don't be surprised sometimes if you take some of these herbs that you may have allergic reaction that's very similar to, to what you have with hay fever in the, in the springtime. Uh, and if you're taking some of these substances, particularly in larger amounts, perhaps beyond what's recommended, we can see your stomach getting upset, we can see diarrhea, we can see constipation. So if you're noticing those types of changes, I always say to someone, if you're gonna start a bunch of, of uh, natural health products, make sure that you're doing it one at a time. So if you're having a reaction to it, you can actually pinpoint what therapy may be problematic. Um, and if you're having any other health conditions like heart or diabetes, you need to be aware that these therapies could also interact with any medications you might be on there. I think this is tricky about the allergic reactions because when you think about some of these things, you probably, a lot of people may have not ever ingested them before. I, I, I remember um, somebody that I know with cancer that um, I think was prescribed mistletoe mm, by natural yes. path and had a very adverse reaction that required hospitalization. And, um, but having never probably taken mistletoe before, like 
it's hard to know whether you're going to have an, an allergic reaction or to anticipate that. Um, is there a more appropriate time to be trying some of these complementary therapies when we when we look at treatment? Mm -hmm. And it's funny we have we have a we have a slide all about that. Okay, you know and. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of, uh, of us, you know, recommend to individuals, particularly, you know, if they are, you know, with early stage disease, they're right in the midst of, of active treatment, that this is probably not a great time to be starting something like a natural health product. Uh, a lot of these therapies, we're not sure how they interact with some of the medications that we're providing. We don't want anything to interfere. There's been some concern that uh, if you're using high dosages of antioxidants, I'm talking, you know, taking that in supplement form, that it could actually prevent radiation and chemotherapy from working as effectively as it could. Um, and so we often say, you know, maybe focus on a healthier diet. You know, if you have the energy, start, you know, exercising or perhaps doing one of the mind body therapies. And then when you're at the end of your treatment, you can then maybe sit down with someone that's experienced with these therapies and work out a plan. You know, and we often see people doing that when they move into that survivorship period. You know, when people do unfortunately experience a reoccurrence, we do see them kind of revisit this decision. And I do think I want to emphasize that, you know, everyone has a right to make a choice about these therapies. My hope is that it's an informed choice. Uh, and there may be some individuals that say, you know what, I, I, I tried, you know, the conventional route. I now want to kind of try to cover all the bases. I might want to add some different therapies in. Uh, and that's why it's really important to have a conversation with your oncologist with a pharmacist, perhaps with uh, a nurse on your team, a dietitian, to really kind of say, would this make sense? Is there a way that we can work this in safely into my treatment plan? But, you know, we're always concerned about interactions uh, and it's, it, it can, like, you know, the, my chiropractic example, it can be something that's not just about the ingestibles. Uh, and just being conscious that, you know, it, it's exhausting as you all know, to go through cancer treatment. Uh, it can impact you financially and be aware that some of these therapies could take a lot of time and a lot of money and making sure that you're balancing that and not becoming um, very stressed because of trying to do it all uh, at one yeah. time. Yeah, just coming back to something you said, Linda, um, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about this more later on, but yeah. you, about having those conversations, what do you think um, prevents people from sharing with their medical team that they might want to explore complementary therapies? Yeah, we, we know that up to 60% of cancer patients don't talk to their, their healthcare team about these therapies. And there's a range of reasons, you know, some are, are scared. They're worried about having a very negative reaction, um, which unfortunately I have seen, uh, but I've also seen some very supportive ones as well. But I think they're worried about, you know, um, being told not to use them, being told they're, they're being silly to use these. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. I think some people might be have used these therapies for years. And so they don't really see the relevance of, of informing uh, their healthcare team about using them. Um, and I think other ones are saying, well, what's the point? Because, you know, I've tried to talk about it in the past and they don't know anything about it. So it's not really useful. I always encourage people that, you know, if someone says, I don't want to talk about it, or I don't know anything about it. It's still important to say, I'd like it to be on my record that I'm using these therapies. So if there's any issues in the future, if we see any negative you know, reactions, everyone's on board, everyone knows what I'm using, uh, my conventional medicine, as well as all the other therapies I could be using. And if I'm having a really great result, we also then have that documented that this person's doing really well. And isn't it interesting that they're on this diet or they're on this, this specific therapy? Yeah, that's very true. I mean, when I've heard from some patients about the things that they're doing and are working, yeah, you just want to shout it out to the world that try this and it seems to be working for somebody. So yeah, it's exactly. good news, good news to share. And it's funny that, you know, we, we did a study, the study where we did our survey, where we actually uh, worked really closely with the pharmacy department at Cancer Care, and they added uh, a ton of natural health products to their formulary. So it actually can be captured as part of your, your medication list. Uh, so I, I strongly encourage, you know, everyone to share it um, so that we have that information actually captured. And it will really support us in the future of doing research to see what is working and, and, and you know, where the safety issues are. 
Great. You know, there's a few other things I just wanted to kind of touch on really quickly, you know, and it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole with all these various therapies. And I just want to encourage people to first think about their foundation. And I, you know, I say you, you need to think about just, are, are you getting good sleep? You know, are you eating a healthy diet, not doing anything radical, but just, you know, following the food guide, having lots of fruits and vegetables, you know, are you being sun safe, you know, in the summertime? So just thinking about your general health and well-being, are you managing your stress? And that goes a long way to supporting you and, and helping you through your cancer experience. You know, I also encourage people to think about what's your goal for using a therapy, because when you start diving into perhaps some of the evidence, you really want to make sure that you're looking, you know, at therapies that are actually going to help you reach your goals. So if it's about managing pain, you know, that's, you know, one set of evidence. If it's about preventing a reoccurrence, it's a totally different set of, of studies. So being really clear about why you're using a therapy. And it's okay if you're using it because you want to get a sense of control over your cancer experience. It, I had one woman tell me it was like an escalator I couldn't get off, you know, and it's also okay if you're using it to preserve your hope. Uh, it can be a very challenging experience for many individuals. These therapies can give individuals hope. They also can be very reflective of their culture and how they've addressed their, their, their health and well-being for years. And it's important that we honor those beliefs and those traditions that are important to us and to our families and communities. You know, and what will be the impact on your quality of life? And I've touched on this already. I've, I've seen individuals where they've decided to, you know, go down to Mexico, you know, and leave their family and spend thousands of dollars on a treatment plan that unfortunately we don't have strong evidence for isolated them from their family during a very key time and in the end it had a very negative impact on their quality of life so just making sure that you're you're balancing your exploration and your use of these therapies ensuring that you're still doing the things that are important in your life and you're not kind of backing yourself into a corner in terms of finances you know or or, or making choices uh, that you may regret in the future and I think we've already talked about who to talk to. You know, I really encourage you to, to tell your whole cancer team. You can also talk to your family physician or your nurse practitioner in the community. Uh, and I find pharmacists and dietitians are an incredible wealth of information, particularly related to dietary supplements, the vitamins and minerals. So don't forget to include them in your discussions. Right. Um, this makes me think too, I mean, just about, you know, when you use the example of this person that had gone down to Mexico, I mean, there's so much information on the internet. There's so many ways of finding out about alternative medicines and that that are out there. I mean, how do you know who to trust? I mean, most of these things have tons of anecdotal evidence from people saying that they work. And um, what do you advise people like in terms of doing their research on the internet? Yeah. Stories are powerful, but I tell people to avoid the, the, you know, the anecdotes, you know, like the, the story of, you know, my cousin's friend used this, or they have a story of someone that miraculously was cured. And I say, we need to, you know, as, as hope providing those are, they're not evidence. Um, it's based on one person. So it's, it's really about looking for websites, usually that are from either a recognized clinical institution one that's associated perhaps with a university, one that if they are making claims about a therapy, they actually have peer reviewed research um, backing it up. They have those references available to you. Um, we have uh, on the internet, it's called HON, H-O-N. Uh, many websites that have credible information will have a certificate from HON and they will actually have the symbol on their website saying that this is health on the net. Uh, that it's been approved as being credible. Uh, and I'm going to give you some resources at the end that are some very credible websites uh, grounded in complementary medicine and cancer, as well as just complementary medicine in general. So hopefully those websites will be a good starting point uh, for many individuals. Great. I've written that Han down because I wasn't aware of that. It's good to know. Great. So I think we're going to move on to talking, which is probably what you're all here for is talking about um, you know, therapies. And, and before I dive in here, I could spend probably three days talking about the wide variety of therapies that are out there. So I'm really trying to touch on ones that are popular or ones that I've gotten some questions about uh, in the recent uh, past. I also wanna be really clear that I'm a registered nurse and I come from a conventional perspective. 
Um, my sister's a naturopath, so she comes from a, a different perspective and a different paradigm. Uh, and so I just want to acknowledge that this is one paradigm and that there are other, you know, medical paradigms, naturopathic, osteopathic, you know, First Nation healing traditions, traditional Chinese medicine. And I'm just acknowledging where I come from and the type of evidence that I'm using. And I want to acknowledge that there's historical and traditional knowledge out there that I'm not incorporating uh, into this presentation, but I want to acknowledge does have a role in people's decision-making uh, around these therapies. So again, going back to your foundations, I always like to kind of just touch on the fact that we need to start with our lifestyle. Uh, and I know that's a really hard thing to do, particularly during this pandemic where we're all sitting at home, not being able to do the things that we normally uh, would do. But this, um, this what this synth synthesis sorry I got braces today so if I sound like I'm slurring I can't do s's yet so my apologies um this is from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research they've been creating this since I think it's 2003 I know the dietitians can correct me here but they update it on a regular basis uh, and it's basically been created uh, it's a world guideline about what should we be eating and what should we be doing around physical activity to prevent cancer. And their recommendations say it's also to prevent a reoccurrence of cancer. Um, and if I really wanted to summarize it really quickly, uh, and, and I, I can't claim credit to this, someone else, uh, I heard this at a conference, but it's basically we should run from salad bar to salad bar. Uh, it's really about having regular daily, if we can exercise. I think I've seen anywhere between 25 uh, to 50 minutes uh, of exercise, something that makes us break a sweat every day, uh, and being really conscious of our diet. We should try to be, you know, uh, at the ideal weight as possible. We should be trying to eat our fruits and vegetables uh, with lots of colors and our whole grains. We should be avoiding, you know, red meat as much as we can. And we should particularly be avoiding processed meat, especially with nitrates, which have actually been shown to be a, a carcinogen. Um, and I know this is tough during uh, the pandemic, but tough during, uh, you know, your cancer journey as well to exercise and to always eat well, especially if you're not feeling great. And I always tell people that you still need to balance it with, you know, the things in life that you enjoy uh, and not to go in, onto such a restrictive diet that you're not enjoying your, your, your life. The other uh, synthesis that I just wanted to share with you really quickly, um, and yes, I'm, I'm the immediate past president of the Society for Integrative Oncology, so I'm a bit biased here, but we've been creating guidelines since 2007 uh, for general cancer patients, for individuals living with lung and breast cancer. Uh, and you can go online. Uh, this is a, an organization that represents all the different disciplines in oncology, but we also have a very strong patient advocacy uh, group as well. In fact, our secretary of our organization is a patient advocate. And so you can go online and gain access uh, to these guidelines. And I think they're, they're great to share with uh, your health professionals, but they also give you a really evidence-based perspective of what therapies have strong enough evidence to use, which ones still need more research and which ones could potentially be, uh, be risky. Uh, and I just wanted to share that we're partnering with ASCO, uh, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. And we have through three more guidelines that are just under development right now, specifically on pain, fatigue, and anxiety and depression. And these are specific to the use of complementary medicine uh, in the context of these symptoms. So um, we're hoping to have all three of those out in the next a year and a half, two years. Uh, so stay tuned, they'll all be publicly available uh, through our website. And this is just an example of our ASCO guidelines for breast cancer, uh, where really it's the mind-body therapies that are recommended. Things like music therapy, meditation, stress management, yoga, massage, all of these have been shown to help people with anxiety, with distress, you know, with depression. We also see improved quality of life when people engage on a regular basis on these types of therapies. You know, we see acupressure and acupuncture also being helpful for things like uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. What really was clear, uh, and this was done a few years ago, we will be updating it, is that there was no strong evidence that any dietary supplement uh, would be effective in managing any uh, treatment related adverse effects. Uh, it was a bit controversial. There was a couple that came close. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see when we update it if a few more 
kind of uh, push into that level of recommendation. Yeah, definitely. Because we often hear about people using um, certain herbs or, or um, you know, for nausea and things like that yeah. and, and finding them helpful. Exactly. And I'm actually, I'm going to touch on ginger. It's, uh, it's going to be coming up here because yeah. there, there, there is some evidence. And this is where I think the paradigms became interesting because as mm -hmm. we worked with ASCO, which comes from a very biomedical paradigm, even though we had some uh, evidence around things like uh, mistletoe, around ginger, um, when we got together as a group, it was just felt that we didn't have large enough uh, clinical trials that were rigorously designed to be able to support those recommendations. And so, you know, they're conservative guidelines, but I think it's a great starting point for this overall field. Yeah, for sure. Maybe just before we, we get into each of these different um, therapies, we could poll our audience and oh. just to ask them uh, about what type of therapies they've already tried um, or are, per, are currently maybe um, trying. So I'm just gonna send the second poll to your screen so we can check in. So. Um, yeah, so you should be seeing a question just asking, what complementary therapies have you tried or are you currently using? So again, if you don't see that poll and you want to share a comment in the Q&A, you can go ahead and do that as well. And this, of course, is probably doesn't include everything that, that's out there, but we tried to <laughs> include as much as we could. This is fascinating. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like our survey all over. <laughs> a, a lot more mind body, which is great to see. Okay, we'll just give it a, a few more seconds here to get some more results in. Okay, I'm just gonna end the polling right now and then share the results with you. So Linda, can you see the results there? I can, yeah. And we're almost at we're 80% for natural health products, which isn't surprising. And, you know, I always say to people like that could include a multivitamin. It could include your vitamin D or your calcium, which is, you know, often recommended, you know, especially for, for women with breast cancer or individuals that, you know, may have some bone density issues. So not surprising at all. It's great to see that we're, we're seeing the mind-body therapies over 50% are using it. Uh, interesting to see the chiropractic and massage. I'd love to break that down to see how many were massage and how many were, were chiropractic. chiropractic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's great to see. And then the energy medicines and the medical cannabis, which we're, we're going to touch on. It's definitely a specialty area of mine. We're seeing growing interest. And I think the, the pandemic has actually shown that, uh, you know, the surveys that have been done that the pandemic has led to an increase in, in cannabis use for things like insomnia, for anxiety and for distress. So not surprising we're seeing that among uh, people living with cancer as well. Great, okay, thank you. I'm just gonna close that now. Well, fingers crossed, I'm gonna cover a lot of the therapies that you're, uh, you're thinking about. I'm just going to, there we go. So I got so many screens going here. That's okay, yeah. So, so the one I'm going to jump into is the one that I think everyone should be doing, I should be doing, uh, which is mindful-based stress reduction, which is a fancy name for a, a therapy, which is meditation that's been specifically developed uh, for individuals living with cancer. Uh, it's quite structured. Uh, it has an educational component to it. It combines meditation with half a yoga techniques with some movement, a lot of breath work, and it's ministered typically over eight weeks. Um, and it really came from John Kabat-Zinn, who was really promoting this notion of having this moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness of the world around us. So being in the present and not thinking about the past or, or, or the future. There's been numerous clinical trials all around the world with individuals living with cancer, and it's shown that it helps them improve their mood, helps with sleep quality, uh, I have just, and a reduction. I think that's a reduction of things like uh, distress and anxiety and depression. Uh, and what's been really fascinating about uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction is that it has a positive impact on the immune system. So my, my friend and colleague, Linda Carlson at Tom Baker in Calgary uh, has actually been able to show that the telomeres, which is a component of our cellular makeup, which has been associated with longevity and survivorship, 
uh, actually is lengthened when people have a committed long-term practice related to, to mindfulness and meditation. So um, that's a real positive. Uh, and what's really interesting is the pandemics closed down a lot of those programs. And so uh, Linda is right in the middle of uh, creating the seamless trial, uh, which is going to focus on offering it through a virtual format. Uh, and hopefully that will extend the reach of this program uh, to people that are in maybe rural or remote regions. Great. Mm -hmm. And then of course we've got yoga. Uh, and I always, you know, I think it's important to, to, to mention that there is, you know, yogic therapy, uh, which comes from, you know, a, a very grounded tradition from the subcontinent of India um, that has, uh, can have a religious component to it. What I'm talking about here is more the, the movement therapy. Um, so it's kind of pulled away from its uh, religious kind of leanings and is much more just focused on things like meditation, breath work and positions uh, that are supposed to, you know, not only promote that groundedness and centeredness, but it also is supposed to help us physiologically in terms of our balance, uh, as well as things like um, stiffness and flexibility, which, which can be impacted by our, our cancer treatments. Um, and so the evidence again is becoming quite overwhelming that yoga does seem to support individuals. A lot of this research has been done in women with breast cancer, but we're starting to see trials in other uh, types of cancer that shows that it again helps people with their sleep, it helps them with their quality of life, uh, and it can promote overall well being, uh, both socially and, and emotionally. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine in India. Uh, Dr. Rao has actually shown that when you compare it to supportive counseling, it actually helped people in controlling uh, their nausea uh, after chemotherapy. It lifted their mood and their quality of life. And he also did some of the cellular research that suggested that it also has an impact on the immune system as well. And, and that kind of makes sense that when we're stressed as, as an individual, our overall body is stressed. And so being able to engage in a practice that reduces our, our cortisol levels, our blood pressure, you know, um, can be very supportive and, and may have an impact on our immune system if we're consistent with that practice. Another one that has had a lot of attention, and in fact, there was a big press release just a couple of weeks ago with my, um, my, my friends, uh, Jun Mao and Ting Bao, who are at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. Uh, they just released a trial that was looking at electroacupuncture uh, and ear acupuncture, and they were really interested in whether it would have um, a role in uh, the chronic musculoskeletal pain that cancer patients can experience going into their survivorship period. Uh, and it actually was found to have a positive impact. In particular, the electroacupuncture was found to be quite useful. For those that don't know much about acupuncture, um, there's kind of two main camps around it. There's one that's very much grounded in traditional Chinese medicine, where there's this notion that we have this energy in our body called qi, and it flows along a meridian system with key points called acupoints that when stimulated can help with the flow of energy. If you look at it from more of a conventional medicine perspective, we're much more interested in how it may impact um, certain hormones being released within our body. Uh, how does it impact how pain is being perceived within our body and within our brain? And we're still doing a lot of MRI studies to try to understand how stimulation uh, through acupuncture and acupressure actually is processed within our brain. So. Um, again, those two paradigms are kind of uh, at play there. Um, it's not always about needles. It can be about applying pressure, about applying heat. Um, and we've seen other positive results related to things like chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And we're just beginning to see studies coming out that are suggesting either comparable effects to medication or comparable effects um, you know, to other interventions related to acupuncture, helping people with fatigue, that was particularly in lung cancer patients, uh, peripheral neuropathy, which can happen after some of the taxane, or platinum uh, chemotherapies that people receive. Um, uh, Dr. Garland, who's from Newfoundland, has been looking at its role in insomnia. Uh, and then there's been some interest down at MD Anderson in Houston around xerostomia or, or having the, the mouth mouth ulcers and dry mouth being improved uh, through, through acupuncture stimulation. Um, we haven't seen anything around lymphedema um, or around joint pain at this present time. 
Um, I think I had read, and I'm not sure if it was um, on what website, if it was your own website, but it's something about um, acupuncture, I guess, in some European countries being part, like almost integrated right into their hospital settings. Is, do, is that true? Like that there are some countries that have moved to just make it like kind of uh, an available practice as part of people's treatment? It is. It is. Like I have a, a colleague that's done a lot of the research in, in Switzerland, uh, Claudia Witt, uh, and through the Charte system, which is in Switzerland and Germany, because of the research they've done, they've just embedded it as part of their, their cancer treatment, particularly around things like peripheral neuropathy or pain that's not being uh, improved uh, through some of the first and second line pain medications. Uh, I've been fortunate to go to China as well and Taiwan, and I've also seen uh, forms of acupuncture or acupressure being integrated uh, into their symptom management programs as well. So it's, um, and we do see it in, in, in some of the pain clinics in Canada. Uh, I have seen some hospitals that are starting to integrate it, but it, it requires, um, you know, it requires the support from the powers that be, I think, to have those, those therapies integrated. So I'm going to jump now into um, some of the natural health products because, you know, 80% of you are using natural health products and that's often where the greatest uh, questions are. So, you know, while I mentioned that the SAO guidelines for breast cancer was saying that there's, you know, no natural health products that we would recommend for managing the symptoms or side effects, ginger's one that's kind of on the verge. Um, it's, it's, an, it's actually a powerful antiemetic. So when your mom or dad, you know, or your partner tells you to drink ginger ale because you're not feeling well, there's something behind that, although most of our ginger ales have very little ginger in it. Uh, but it does seem to help uh, in, in terms of controlling nausea and vomiting. It's important to note, though, that in large quantities, it can impact our platelets and, and kind of lead to bruising and, and bleeding. Um, and it's thought to also have an anti-inflammatory, potentially an anti-tumor effect, but I've not seen any trials that have specifically looked at, at that um, characteristic of it. Um, you know, it's been interesting. We see these trials in, in 2000 that were going back and forth saying, you know, it seems to have a positive effect. Uh, this was often grating uh, ginger and putting it into a tea and it seemed to help people alongside their traditional antiemetic medications in managing their nausea and vomiting. And what's interesting is we've just seen a meta analysis come out that's actually suggested that yes, it, it does seem to have a positive effect. Um, but as I mentioned, you need to be a bit careful in using it in large amounts, particularly if you're going in for surgery. It also is something that can affect blood sugar levels. So if you're diabetic or your blood sugars are being monitored, it's something uh, to be aware of. But if you're cooking it into a stir fry, typically you're not consuming it at a level that would be uh, of concern. Curcumin or turmeric is one that's been of great interest. Um, it's actually part of the ginger family. You probably are using it if you're making a curry or uh, different dishes. It's also a really powerful antioxidant. It's thought to also, in, in, in cellular research, have an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, because it's part of the ginger family, it also can impact our platelets and our clotting as well. Uh, and what's been interesting is when they've done a lot of test tube research, it actually seems to cause apoptosis, which is uh, killing cancer cells. But you know what happens in a test tube, it's really hard to transfer that to a human. And one of the biggest issues with curcumin is it's not easily taken up and absorbed in our bodies. You typically need to consume it in a fat or in something called pepperine, which is a, a component from the pepper plant. Um, they've actually come up in the last few years with some really cool um, mechanisms to increase uptake uh, in the human body. Uh, and what's been interesting is that there's been some lab studies to suggest that it does have an anti-tumor effect uh, and seems to almost potentiate uh, chemo and radiation and make cells more sensitive to it. But again, we need to see what the trials are saying. Uh, and there's only been a few trials. One's been done in advanced pancreatic cancer where it did seem to, to show some uh, shrinkage of the tumors. There's been some interesting work with prostate cancer uh, patients that have shown that their PSA levels didn't change, but they weren't elevating. So something was, was definitely being suppressed there. Uh, and as I said, there's starting to be in the literature a real interest in whether um, it's not going to cure cancer, but can it make cells more sensitive to chemotherapy agents or radiation? Um, so that's going to be an interesting line uh, of study. 
Um, there's been some concern that it could actually interact with things like cyclophosphamide or doxyrubicin, which many of you are on uh, if you're living with breast cancer. So it's good to have a consult with your pharmacist, especially if you're thinking of taking this in, in a supplement form and not just part of uh, your diet. Just um, if you could clarify yeah. um, for us, um, Linda, you said about the turmeric or uh, something about taking it with uh, pepper as to help uptake of that. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's just, um, and then this is where, you know, my, my biochemistry fails me. Um, but there's just, um, it, it's just, it's, it's a, a natural health product that's just very difficult for our body to actually absorb. And what we've seen is that when it's combined um, in a fat uh, of some sort, you know, this is often used, uh, you know, in, in South Asian cooking, you know, in ghee or something like that, when it's actually embedded within like a, a, a fat, there seems to be greater absorption. What's been interesting is they've also shown that when it's used alongside, and this is people that were doing some of the clinical trial research, they used pepperine, which is coming from black pepper that when they combined those components together, there was again, greater absorption. Um, I can't give you the, you know, this is where hopefully maybe the dietitians could help out, um, but I can't give you the mechanism of that action. It's just, they just recognize that this isn't being absorbed and we have to find some ways to get the body to be able to, to uptake it. Okay. Yeah. So if you sprinkle some black pepper in with your turmeric, it might actually, <laughs> potentially, I, I like to think it works that way, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the body's a bit more complex than that. But, okay. uh, <laughs> You mentioned this earlier, Kathleen, which is mistletoe, also known as, as escador, is what it's used uh, in Europe. Um, this is a parasitic plant that, you know, when I was in Vancouver, it would be growing on the side of, of hedges. Um, and again, when we look at the bench studies, the cell studies, it does seem to kill cancer cells. Um, and there does seem to potentially have an immune system uh, response. It is, though, quite a toxic plant. And even when people are being monitored and administered it, they can have a severe allergic reaction. We often, it's often given as a sub Q uh, injection under the skin. We see site uh, rashes that come from it. Uh, people can have chills and fever. So this is not something to undertake on your own. It's something that you should be uh, closely monitored in using. And in fact, uh, in Europe, most people that are using it are part of a clinical trial. I, I have a colleague in Sweden, um, Katrin Wode, who's currently doing a clinical trial on it, and they, they always administer it in a clinical uh, setting. And never eat mistletoe, the berries or the plant. Um, it is very toxic and it can lead to, uh, actually to death. You know, this is one of those therapies that when we were doing the ASCO guidelines, it was, it was on the verge. There is um, some concern because of the side effects that, that the benefits um, aren't large enough for it to be used. You know, I was looking today to see if there's any uh, new research. Uh, and what's interesting is a whole bunch of, of systematic reviews came out in the last couple of years that really suggest that they're not seeing any survival benefits, but people seem to be reporting an improved quality of life. And, you know, could that be a placebo effect? Could there be some other mechanism underlying that? We're not sure at this time. Um, you know, I think we really need to wait till these well-designed trials in Europe are completed where they have blinding, they have a larger sample size to really be sure um, whether this is a therapy that's safe and whether it actually could have an impact on something like survivorship. Linda, if I could just uh, mm. pause for a second. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions that sure. maybe we can come back to later about acupuncture um, because there was a couple more on that. But we just talked about turmeric and uh, one of our viewers asked about uh, turmeric preventing blood vessels from vessels from feeding the tumor for brain tumors. Um, how does that work with the brain barrier? It's a great question. And I... I know that a lot of most of the research has been looking at, you know, kind of preventing, you know, blood vessel formation towards the tumor. I don't necessarily know if it's been done in, in like glioblastomas or in brain cancer in particular. I think most of that research has been more at the bench level versus actually doing it within the human body. And, and as you know, that individual pointed out, the challenge with brain cancer often is that barrier. Uh, and how do we get a substance through it? And because of, of the struggles we've had with curcumin and having to typically attach it to some type of a fatty acid, it may make it even more challenging for it to work within uh, the brain. 
Um, but that's something that I can always go into a little bit more of a deeper dive into to see if there's been any more recent studies uh, around that. Um, I know, as I said, in the last couple of years, it seems they've been focusing on better delivery mechanisms. So I wouldn't be surprised if they've come up with a, a new mechanism for that, that I can always, uh, I can send that information to you and you can follow up with that individual. Thank you. Um, and again, we'll come back to some of these questions at the end of your presentation. Um, but there is a question regarding um, someone that has myeloid leukemia, concerned about a third occurrence. Um, mm. They're especially conscious of anti-inflammatory foods. So I guess we're talking more about some of the um, properties of, that you might find in certain certain foods, like looking at some of the herbs and vitamins. But is that something that we can um, that you'll have some more ideas about anti-inflammatory anti-inflammatory foods, or is it more or less the um, the herbs and that that you would use in your cooking? Yeah, um, you know, I think when I get to ketogenic, um, I probably okay. will be touching on that because I think one of the mechanisms um, that people are exploring right now with ketogenic is is it an anti-inflammatory uh, okay. diet? Um, I think we're really at the beginning stages trying to understand how you know we can modify our diets you know what's the role of the microbiome uh, around things like inflammation and then trying to link that to to cancer formation and i think that's where we see the most i think one of the most innovative research going on right now is trying to understand how does inflammation uh you know play a role in the formation of cancer so i'll, I'll touch on it a little bit in in the ketogenic diet section i think yeah. You know, soya, you know, when I started doing research in this field, we were telling, especially women with breast cancer, don't touch soya, don't consume soya. You know, this is a, a legume that that's, uh, plays a large role in, in diets, particularly in Asia, although it's really quite widespread now around the world. Um, and there's been a real concern because it has phytoestrogens. Um, in it that mimic the estrogen that's produced in our body, that it actually could have um, a negative impact, particularly on individuals that have uh, ER positive breast cancer. Uh, and what's been really fascinating is that we've been doing these large scale cohort studies where we've been following thousands of, of women over time, not only looking at whether uh, consuming soya increases the risk of breast cancer, but does it have a role after people have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And what's been fascinating is that um, there was a, a large US uh, China study that was recently completed that showed that having, you know, about 10 milligrams of isoflavins a day, which is just kind of part of your everyday diet, they actually saw a reduced risk of, of breast cancer specific mortality. It wasn't a significant finding, but they did see a, a reduction uh, in, in, in mortality. Um, and they did see a statistically significant reduced risk of, of reoccurrence. Um, and so that kind of just changed everyone's mindset. And what it made them kind of realize is that um, the way that phytoestrogen, the lignans were working is that they actually seem to be blocking the receptors versus stimulating the receptors. And so the very basic idea and then the thought process behind this is that it's preventing estrogen from actually being taken up and potentially causing growth. Uh, and there's actually been some studies now in, in the US and Canada that have actually shown that people that are consuming, you know, um, high amounts of isoflavins actually do see a decrease as well uh, related to, to death from, from breast cancer. Um, so what I think the main emphasis is here is that this isn't like, let's go out and, and start taking soya supplements. Um, you know, we don't wanna be like eating soya at every single meal. This is where the idea of having, you know, maybe some tofu for dinner, having some soy milk in the coffee. You know, there's some great resources, I think through Shared Health uh, that one of the dietitians shared with me um, that says, you know, having a half a cup of soy milk is, is reasonable uh, and actually, you know, maybe supportive. Um, the one thing that's still a bit of a question mark um, is that there's not been any human studies right now to suggest the soya interact with things like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. Um, there's some question about it. I've seen a few cohort studies that say we don't see an interaction at this time, but we don't have any kind of clinical trials that, that, that show that one way or the other. So I think that's where it's important to sit down with a dietitian 
you know, or with your, your physician or nurse practitioner and have a conversation. Um, but definitely avoid using massive amounts in a supplement form. But, um, you know, if you enjoy soya, which I know many people do, it's okay to have it as part of your, uh, your diet. I added this one in quickly last night because uh, someone said that they had a question about noni. And a lot of people are like, what's noni? And it's actually a fruit from an evergreen plant that we typically see, you know, being used within Polynesian culture. Um, and it's again, an antioxidant, it's an anti-inflammatory, it seems to have an impact on the immune system. But again, this is looking at a cell line in a test tube. Um, we haven't seen any clinical trials at this time. So it's really hard to say whether this, you know, fruit is actually going to be effective and what dose you would need to consume for it to be effective. You know, yes, we're seeing all these anti-cancer effects on things like lung, cervical, leukemia, and breast cells, but what happens when you consume that in the human body? Um, you know, and I think there's a bit of concern that we've seen some case studies where people have started drinking noni juice in large quantities, and we've actually seen some kidney and liver issues. These are like just cases of individuals, you know, and of one, but it's concerning. So this is suggesting that you shouldn't be doing this every day. This shouldn't be something that becomes a huge part of your diet. It does seem to impact things like potassium level, which can impact um, your heart functioning. We've also seen that it can interact with things like Coumadin, which is for blood clotting, things like uh, phenytoin for if you have a seizure disorder. So this is again, consult your dietitian, consult your pharmacist. Don't be taking a bunch of noni juice home and drinking it, you know, 24 seven. I wish we had more studies, but as people I think continue to use it, we probably will see those studies come. I also was asked to kind of touch on flaxseed. Um, and, you know, this has actually been used for years. If you think about having to take lin linseed oil, that's what you were taking. It's very rich in omega-3 fatty acids and fiber, but it also has this lignin that, you know, is very similar to what we saw in soya, which has this phytoestrogen effect. You know, animal studies, again, have shown that it may inhibit certain cancers like breast and prostate and melanoma. Um, and we're just starting to see the studies coming out. So, so Wendy uh, DeMarc Wannafried has, has a whole research program um, that's been focused on this. She's been looking at using flaxseed in men with prostate cancer, and she has been showing lower biomarkers. She's also been able to do it before they've had surgery to show that there's been a lower tumor growth as well. Uh, and there's been a, a, some small trials done looking at women with breast cancer. They gave them flaxseed muffins. Um, and they actually had improved biomarkers as well. Uh, and we haven't seen any interaction specifically with tamoxifen. Usually the dose is between three to four tablespoons a day. Uh, and we haven't seen any interactions with that type of, um, you know, adjuvant endocrine therapy at this time. Um, if you've taken ever flaxseed in a smoothie, you will know that it can change your, 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 your stool and your bowel movements. Uh, and can be uh, a bit gas producing. So, so beware and, and don't start at, at four tablespoons, start with one if, and work your way up. That seems like a lot of flaxseed, three to four tablespoons. A day. Exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, the other thing too, is I had a few people ask about, does it protect your heart? Um, obviously with certain chemotherapies, you're concerned about the cardiotoxic effects. Uh, and there is some thought that it could be um, protective. Unfortunately, we only see um, mice models to date. We don't see any human trials. There is some suggestion it could be helpful. Um, it's not one of those therapies that's going to be harmful if you're just consuming it as part of your diet, but we need um, better research to be able to actually recommend it um, as a cardioprotective agent. So kind of related to that is the omega-3s. Again, it's a, it's a fish oil, pa uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. Um, most of the research has been around heart health. Like we do know it helps with uh, cholesterol levels. It doesn't necessarily relate to cardiac outcomes, but it does seem to affect those biomarkers related to our heart. Um, actually, there's been some thought it can actually help with depression as well. Um, there was some thought that it could help with preventing cancer. Uh, and we've had a couple of these large scale cohort studies where they followed people that have been consuming a whole bunch of different supplements, including omega-3s. Uh, the SELECT study was with prostate. The VITAL cohort study was with breast cancer. 
Uh, and there has been some thought that it decreases the risk of both types of cancer. But a cohort study is not a clinical trial. So there could be some other factor, um, you know, that could be explaining that, but there's some suggestion maybe it's helpful. Um, kind of like flaxseed, you have to watch out what it happens to your gut. Um, and it can interact with um, blood clotting agents like warfarin as well. So just beware. So this is one that you know was in vogue and then it wasn't, and now I think it's coming back again. Um, is IV vitamin C, and there's been you know conversations for years in cancer about could vitamin C, ascorbic acid, you know, actually help in preventing cancer. And there's been a ton of research from the time of Linus Pauling, you know, suggesting that if you apply it in large amounts, it kills cancer cells. Maybe it it makes uh, cancer cells more sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation. Um, there's been a few trials, one by, by Hoffer, who actually um, is from Montreal, um, and it didn't seem to improve survival. However, people reported, um, you know, that they could tolerate it. Uh, they were doing it through an IV intravenous route, because if you consume large amounts orally, it just gets peed out of your system. So giving it IV meant that they had a higher level of the ascorbic acid in their system. Um, people seem to tolerate it, although we have seen some issues if you're prone to kidney stones. We've seen a few people with stomach upset and they can't do the large dosages. Um, and there's been a few really tiny studies that suggested it could improve quality of life and symptoms related to chemotherapy. But I often wonder if it's because they're getting more hydration through the intravenous uh, solution. Um, and there's been some concern because it's a it's an antioxidant. Could it impair chemotherapy? You know, I've heard of people using their ports uh, for chemo to also get their IV vitamin C because it's so acidic. It can actually destroy the port, which means you have to get it replaced. So you know, even though we haven't seen um, any evidence of interaction, I think this is one of those therapies we say you know it's best to wait until your chemotherapy is completely finished if this is something that you want to pursue um, in the future. There was one small study that linked it to, to liver cancer, very small. Um, not sure how, how persuasive that is. It is something that's mentioned in some of the databases. So I just thought I would put that in there, just full disclosure. So then cannabis, <laughs> um, you know, this is a, a plant incredibly complex, you know, more than 120 different cannabinoids. Um, THC and CBD are the ones you've probably heard the most about and where it's most of the, the attention is right now. Uh, and it's been used for, for thousands of years, not only, um, you know, for medicine, but also recreationally. Uh, and you probably all know it's legal, both the non-medical and the medical in Canada right now. There is some thought um, that it could have a role in managing pain, nausea and vomiting and seizures. And we know now that CBD definitely has a role in managing um, severe seizure disorders like Dervais in children. Uh, and it's been approved by the FDA um, as Epidiolex uh, in the United States. In terms of pain and nausea and vomiting, there are some recommendations in Canada that suggest that um, cannabis can be used. It's typically not a first line treatment. We'll see it being used third or fourth line um, when people are not responsive to their medications. Um, I think what's been really intriguing is uh, there's been uh, growing attention about are, are there anti-cancer effects uh, from cannabis? And if so, what cannabinoids are responsible for that? A lot of that, again, goes back to that, that comment around inflammation. Does it have a role in managing inflammation? What role does the endocannabinoid system have in our body related to, to cancer formation? There's only been uh, two really small, small studies. We're talking 20, 30 people that's focused on uh, glioblastoma patients with brain tumors. Uh, one used a set of X, which is a one-on-one -on -one THC CBD spray. Uh, that did uh, show increased longevity. Another trial did show um, shrinkage uh, of, of the tumor, but very small. And we really need some clinical trials done to see if it has uh, that type of impact. Uh, and you obviously have to weigh it against the numerous side effects that I think most of us know about in terms of, of using cannabis. Um, but I also always say too, you have to weigh it against the side effects of other medications um, like opioids that might be used for managing things like pain. 
Um, we do have some concerns, particularly in children under the age of 25, young adults. Uh, it does impact brain development, particularly before the age of 16. And so there has to be some caution in it being used in that population. Um, and it can have an impact on mental health. If you're using a high THC strain, for example, for anxiety, it can increase anxiety and psychosis and hallucinations in some individuals. Uh, if you have a pre-existing mental health issue like schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, um, it can be problematic, particularly high THC strains. Um, tons of research needs to be done, um, but we're kind of stalled in Canada right now because of how the regulations are framed. Um, I've been part of letter writing campaigns this past month. We're hoping to um, address that and get these studies um, off the ground. And we do locally have Lauren Kelly, uh, who's running the cannabinoid C4T, it's the Childhood Cannabinoid Clinical Trial Network. And she got uh, over a million dollars for funding to look at uh, cannabis in childhood cancer. So hopefully we'll see some good results coming out of uh, C4T. I believe I'm on to my last one, mm -hmm. uh, which is the ketogenic diet, which I'm going to full disclosure, I'm on the ketogenic diet right now. <laughs> and I'm not using it for cancer. I'm using it for weight loss, as well as um, for my sugar addiction. Um, and this is a high fat diet that has uh, limited sugar or glucose and very limited carbohydrates. You typically see people saying around 29, 20, um, 20 to 30 uh, net uh, uh, grams or net carbs, I think it's called net carbs. Uh, so 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, which is very, very low. It's thought to create a metabolic ex a kind of oxidative stress to cancer cells um, and also potentially make them more sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation. Um, we're just starting to see the research uh, come out. We've, we've seen a lot of the safety studies, the phase one studies happen that have shown that people can tolerate it, although a lot of people can't stick with it. It's a very hard diet to stick with because it's, it's quite restrictive uh, if you're a person that enjoys carbs. Um, and um, we've seen it, they've looked at it with glio, uh, glio, glioma patients. Um, and they haven't seen any efficacy, but that was only with 20 patients. So we obviously need these larger trials uh, to occur. Um, what's been interesting is there's been a concern about how it could impact things like, um, you know, cardiac bio uh, markers. You know, how does it impact, you know, um, metabolic syndrome? And that's the interesting thing about ketogenic is that it actually seems to be effective for people that might be moving towards um, being diabetic. Uh, we're not seeing uh, the concerns uh, around the heart biomarkers as, as we originally thought. However, I'm, when I talk to people about this diet, and this is again where the dietitians can really um, take a leading uh, role in, in talking about these types of diets, I never say this should be the steak and eggs and bacon breakfast uh, ketogenic diet. You can definitely do this in a Mediterranean way where you're really focusing on healthier fats like uh, olive oil avocados, um, you know, fatty fishes, uh, still limiting your red meat, uh, limiting, you know, high fat dairy products. Um, there are ways of doing this. And what's interesting is a, a trial just came out uh, last year that was looking at uh, 60 women with breast cancer. Uh, and we saw these improvements in biomarkers as well as we saw uh, them losing weight. We saw improved BMI. Uh, and what was really fascinating is we saw improved survival. So this, I think, is just going to be the start of probably numerous trials that are underway and, and their results coming in terms of, is ketogenic diet something that we should be recommending for individuals? When do we recommend it? Does it have a role in supporting chemo and radiation? Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to see where that evidence takes us. Sure. Linda, I have a ton of questions for you. I have a ton of questions personally, but we actually have a ton of questions from our viewers. So I'm going to start all with those. Okay. Um, and let's go back just to your um, discussion on acupuncture. Somebody asked um, if you could clarify, can acupuncture help with dystonia? I haven't seen any research on dystonia in cancer. I'm not sure what dystonia is actually myself. Yeah. What is dystonia? I'm going to get this wrong because I'm on, my, on the spot here. That's dystonia, okay. <laughs> I, I'm getting it mixed up with stroke. 
<laughs> that's okay. <laughs> One sec. I'm yeah. sorry. No, that's okay. I just I... know that it's not something that's crossed my uh, Estonia. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Movement disorders. We're, um, and my apologies for that. So it was stroke. I was. That's why I was thinking yeah. stroke. I haven't come across it. Um, I'll be honest. I haven't dived into um, that literature mainly because I think it's it's coming more from people that have you know musculoskeletal disorders like stroke and MS. Um, it's something I can look at, but I haven't seen anything that's in the context of cancer. Okay. Um, I think we've been seeing this much more around symptom management. Um, in, you know, ready to chemo and radiation and, and not necessarily seeing dystonia as being uh, one that we're seeing in, in large amounts. So something I can definitely look up. Uh, yeah. And if I find anything, I can, I can send Pass that information. On. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. What about um, somebody, we have a couple of questions regarding brain tumors. Is acupuncture, has there been any research on whether it's helpful for brain tumors that you're aware of? No, I haven't. Unfortunately, no, okay. I haven't seen anything in that context. I think more I actually don't even know if there's been any studies looking at the symptoms and side effects. Yeah. Okay. In the, in the um, population. We also, um, in terms of prostate cancer, somebody is asking about, um, is there natural supplements that have a positive effect on erectile dysfunction? Any, are you aware of any research mm -hmm. on that in terms of natural supplements? I actually am not, you know, the mm -hmm. only research really that's come out around prostate has been around more, um, frequent urination uh, related to benign prostatic hyperplasia. And there was some thought that saw pimento um, is effective in some individuals in that context, but I haven't seen anything related to erectile dysfunction, which is a huge issue and you know definitely needs more research. For sure. Um, and another question related to prostate cancer, when mm -hmm. a prostate has been removed successfully due to a cancerous tumor um, and there's no affected lymph nodes, does that patient or should they still focus on preventing prostate cancer? You know, we're always worried about with, with any type of cancer, you know, it's, it's great news that no, none of the lymph nodes were, were impacted. Um, and, you know, that typically means that cancer has not spread through the body. Um, but cancer, un unfortunately, can be quite insidious and, 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 can find creative ways to, to move throughout the body. So I think, you know, to have a very positive diagnosis with that, I think you can go forward with confidence. However, trying to, you know, improve your foundation, um, you know, related to your diet and your overall health uh, is always helpful. If you can add some of the therapies that we've talked about, you know, like a flax seed, you know, like an omega-3 in a recommended daily amount, you know, to your food, to your diet, I don't think that would be problematic. And it's something that just maybe will in impre increase your confidence uh, going forward. Yeah. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about was uh, garlic. And oh, um, yes. somebody writes that they saw some videos about eating a clove of raw garlic daily to kill cancer cells. Any research on garlic? I had that in a long time ago. And I remember my only comment was, you know, the only thing it can kill is your relationship. Um, I think there's been a few studies that have been done and, and not to make fun of it, but, you know, it's, it, um, there's been, I believe, some studies that were looking at it again at the test tube level. And I, I always say, if you give enough of anything, you know, to a bunch of cells in a test tube, it has a pretty good shot of killing it. Um, I haven't seen a lot of research in, in recent days about, about using it. Um, I, I, you know, raw garlic, a lot of people, it can cause a lot of GI disturbances. Um, I'm allergic um, to, to garlic, so I can have really bad GI symptoms related to it. So um, I, I don't think that's a, a natural health product that's kind of, you know, worth adding to your diet unless you enjoy it. <laughs> And there are ways of eating a uh, garlic that isn't raw. You, there are supplement forms. Um, you have to be careful with garlic though. It does impact your blood sugar level. It also can have a clotting uh, effect as well. And, you know, one thing I want to mention uh, that I didn't earlier is that think about everything I've mentioned that has a clotting impact. <laughs> Just be conscious if you're using 10 different therapies, if they all have a clotting effect, even if you're using them in small amounts, they can have a, a cumulative effect. effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, keto and GBMs, I'm not sure what GBMs refers to is great, but what about other um, brain tumors? Well, I guess that's referring to a type of yeah, um, brain tumor. Yeah, so he says, um, this person or she, pardon me, um, says they have astrocytoma. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen any studies yet uh, focused on that type of, of brain tumor. To be honest, the ketogenic diet, I would say up to like four or five years ago, people kind of made fun of it and just said it's another fad diet. And it's, it's just starting to get traction. Uh, and we're starting to see people say that this seriously needs to be looked at. Um, it's getting that attention, not only in cancer, but also in the management of metabolic syndrome with diabetes. Um, and so I, I think we're going to see a lot more research coming out, but it's, it's unfortunate that we often see in this field that certain groups like GBM or breast cancer seems to get the predominance of attention. And we need to start diversifying our samples so that we're able to, to, to comment on whether these therapies are effective across different types of cancer. Sure. Um, a question regarding keto. Somebody asked what's wrong with eating red meat in the keto diet? You know, the reason I make, and I know not everyone, you know, agrees with me on this one, I'm pulling more from the World Cancer Research Fund. Um, that says that there is some concern, you know, around eating large amounts of red meat uh, in terms of whether it could, you know, the type of fat that's in red meat, could it potentially have an, an impact on, on cardiac outcomes? While the beginning research is suggesting that ketogenic diets um, don't have that negative impact, and that really means people are really into that ketosis and are really using their fat in their body. I think the concern is that many people don't get to that level of ketosis. And so they're not using the fat in their body and the fat they're consuming as effectively. And I think there's just some concern that, um, you know, because people have had trouble adhering to it, that if you're eating a lot of red meats, you could still see those cardiac outcomes come. Um, and I just, I know the, the literature on a Mediterranean diet is quite profound. It's very supportive as being a healthy diet. Uh, and I think there's a growing recognition that uh, keto can be done uh, Mediterranean style. So I'll, I'll admit that's my personal recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think time will tell uh, as we start seeing research that diversifies the ketogenic interventions they're using Mediterranean versus just, you know, animal product to see if there's a difference. Any, um, any research that you're aware of on matcha tea or green tea? We've had a couple of questions from Oof, viewers yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I haven't seen anything specifically on matcha, but it is a form of green tea. Um, I'll be honest, almost, I, I get a, an update every week on new studies that are coming out. And I would say every week there's black tea, green tea, black tea, green tea, black tea, mm -hmm. green tea. Um, and it's been mainly focused on the prevention of um, colorectal cancer and some GI cancers, as well as prostate and breast. Um, and I think some lung as well. And the research seems to, you know, edge towards saying it may help prevent those cancers. We think there's something, you know, I think it's the, I'm going to say it wrong, catechin uh, component that seems, uh, I know the lab studies show that it does kill certain cancer cells. I haven't seen as persuasive evidence that it's effective as a treatment or preventing reoccurrence. I've seen some studies that suggest it is. A lot of this research has been cohort studies where they've just followed populations that consume large amounts and compare them to populations that don't. We need some clinical trials uh, conducted on it to kind of be able to persuasively say, yes, green tea is effective. I think if you enjoy it, you know, I always tell people be careful with green tea. It, it's a herbal tea, but it, it, it has a lot of caffeine in it. And I've seen people come in just wired because they're like drinking it nonstop <laughs> during the day. So um, if you enjoy green tea, you know, having three to four cups a day, um, you know, depending on how it impacts your sleep, it, it's not going to harm you. Um, if you're drinking it as part of your diet, may it have some protective effects that's possible. Okay. How about um, somebody writes that they're on immunotherapy and um, will eating foods with anti-inflammatory properties suppress the effectiveness of the therapy? Not yeah, sure. you know, and, and I'm not going to be able to point to a certain study that can comment on that. I think that, you know, when I've talked to my colleagues that are dietitians, we, you know, we often have a conversation that when you're consuming, you know, foods as part of your diet, um, you're not taking it in supplement form. Our body is, is very good a regulatory system and that we don't tend to see, um, you know, if you're consuming a, a food in regular portions, you know, you're not like drinking the noni juice, you know, 24 seven, you're not going to see that type of, of interaction. So I wouldn't, 
um, feel like you have to go through your grocery list and, and start just slashing things that potentially have an anti-inflammatory effect if you're consuming mm -hmm. them as part of your diet. You just want to be aware that you're not over focusing or using anything in a mega dose kind of supplement manner. Um, and this is a great time to, you know, maybe sit down with a dietitian and have a conversation about that if, if you do have those types of concerns. Great. We have a few more questions. I'm going to try to speed through these a little bit. Um, question about, is there a complementary ther therapy that could be recommended for someone preparing for a bone marrow transplant? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be honest, I've never seen any research that's kind of talked about that. I think you know, I, I immediately kind of went with the mind body therapies. I think it's yeah. important to be in a, in a calm state to be able to control your anxiety. It can be a very anxiety provoking um, experience. Um, I don't think you want to do anything that's going to shift your immune system dramatically. The, the whole idea here is that we are going to kind of, you know, kill off your immune system cells, you know, and allow it to kind of restart. So my advice would be to try to just to have a balanced diet, you know, focus on, on, you know, relaxation, mind body therapies that are going to get you in that right headspace, um, and making sure that you're, um, you know, you're setting up your social network to be able to support you for your recovery afterwards. I think that's the best place to be in terms of focusing your energies. Yeah. One of the other mind-body um, therapies that we didn't talk about today was Qigong. Qigong? Is there a Qigong? Qigong? Yeah. Yeah. Qigong. Um, and yeah. somebody just wanted to know if you had any comments on that, but I guess we could probably just look at that in the same context as meditation and yoga. As yeah, it's very practice. similar. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I'm in the middle of uh, um, working with Linda Carlson on a trial um, that's actually comparing uh, mind, uh, mindfulness and MBR, um, MBSR to Shigong. So mm -hmm. we're actually trying to now say, is there a difference between these two different interventions? We're working with um, Peter Wayne from Harvard on that study. And he's kind of a, a, a guru of, of Shigong research. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some of the research that I've seen on Shigong definitely supports it as an intervention uh, and can have very similar effects to things like yoga, uh, as well as meditation. You know, if you're coming from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, you also would, you know, probably would have a thought process that it has a, a, an energy component to it as well. And it can be energizing. Um, I haven't seen as much research on that uh, in terms of its management around fatigue, um, but it is a therapy that can be quite safe and it can have benefits around, you know, improving balance and flexibility as well as mindfulness. Um, any, uh, any thoughts on how acupuncture helps with neuropathy? Yeah, so, you know, there's definitely been a couple of tr uh, major trials, particularly through um, Memorial Sloan Kettering that have focused on peripheral neuropathy. Uh, Don Hirschman's done some work at Columbia as well. Um, there's been some studies that have shown it's been helpful. And then there's been others that have shown that it's not better than sham acupuncture where the needles um, appear to be being applied, but they're not actually penetrating the skin. And so it's raised some questions about whether it is as effective as, as people originally thought. Um, there's actually um, a research competition. I don't know what's happened with it with the pandemic that was focused on trying to understand the mechanism of action of acupuncture in managing nerve conduction. Um, and I don't think um, that those results have come out yet. And I think we're still trying to understand how it works. Is it impacting how the brain is processing pain with peripheral neuropathy? Is it affecting different nerves in different ways? Is it affecting the myelin sheath? I don't think we're hundred percent sure yet, um, but hopefully that kind of me mechanistic research that they're doing through the National Institutes of Health will help us in better understanding whether it has a role or not. I think that one of the big questions is, you know, is it a placebo? Like, why is it not different than sham? Or is the sham still stimulating the points um, because it's being applied in the exact same points as the acupuncture? So there's a lot of work to still be done in understanding how acupuncture works from our, our Western perspective. Um, we didn't talk about juicing or in general, and, and somebody yeah. had, a, had a question, but yeah. maybe that's a question that, that could be given to uh, or posed to one of our dietitians, yeah. you know, about juicing. I've always and... heard that, you know, 
it's, it's, it's better to eat the whole fruit because you're not just getting then, you know, those, those nutrients and the juice, you're getting the fiber as well. And so I, that's what I've always heard. And again, consulting a dietitian would be best for that. But my advice is eat the whole fruit and get the fiber as well, which we know helps with things like colorectal cancer. A question about mRNA vaccines. I'm not familiar with that. Are you? Um, (laughs) Well, that's the, (laughs) so I I think we're going down the COVID, the COVID route right now. And I'll be honest, I don't know much about that. So. Okay. Okay. We'll leave. And um, somebody asked about someone uh, recovering from ileostomy reversal surgery. Is there any sort of thoughts on complementary therapies that could be helpful? You know, from my perspective, if you're doing that reversal, you know, your gut's going to be sensitive, it, it's, it's going to be sore. And so my advice is that you probably don't want to um, take anything unique that could impact it, you know, one way or the other, you know, particularly want to take anything that's going to cause constipation. Um, you probably want to consult a dietitian in terms of the appropriate diet, because again, something like the keto diet, I think can many people can find very constipating when you're losing some of those carbohydrates. So I think, you know, it's important to be kind to your gut during that process so it can heal and recover. Um, and the dietitian would be best to suggest a diet that would help you along that road. One last question. I'm not familiar with this book by Jane McClelland, um, a book and a course called How to Starve Cancer. Are you familiar with that at all? I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Using repurposed drugs. Someone just asked whether you had read it, I guess, and wanted to comment on it. <laughs> I haven't read, I haven't read it. Um, you know, I think there's still a lot of interest in just off-label drugs and, and their potential role. If that's what the focus of the, I heard the, the subtitle sounds like it was about repurposing drugs and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think one of the most fascinating things, you know, I'm part of the Canadian Cancer Trials Group um, for the, the Breast Cancer Executive. And what's been fascinating to me was over the course of my career, seeing aspirin as, you know, and salicylic acid and willow bark being considered this kind of alternative treatment to cancer to now seeing it under a full trial funded by the CCTG um, because it does seem to have a role in in the treatment of of breast cancer. So I think that we need to be creative. We need to be open to when people seem to do extraordinarily well um, and they happen to be on other medications. Um, I think there's a lot of role for looking at off-label drugs. Um, And I hope we're gonna also keep an open mind to some of these natural health products, the role you know, of our gut, uh, the role of inflammation, um, and be a little bit more um, cognizant of, you know, just our lifestyle and and how it can play a role in in the prevention of cancer, as well as helping us to live uh, healthy lives after cancer. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda, and and for sharing your knowledge and for um, all our viewers and the great questions that you've um, asked to generate this discussion today. I just uh, feel like I have lots of questions uh, to ask as well. But, you know, the human body is just so complex. And I I think it's great that we're having this discussion because to look at it from different angles can only be helpful. So, um, and I just want to say, like, I think my slides are going to be made available. Is that? Yes, for sure. Well, we can, um, if you'd like them to be made available or even just the uh, slides on your resources, we can um, yeah. use photocopy. I think that would yeah. be great because I, yeah. I just I know we don't have time for it, but there's just yeah. there's a lot of great resources that are credible out there that you know I encourage you to to check out and to explore, particularly related to the natural health products. Um, there's some great resources that you can download and you can access as a patient and you can share with your healthcare team. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Kathleen, for uh, yeah, inviting me. Yeah, I appreciate me. this. Uh, a lot of them. Um, and again, another plug, uh, if you go to cameoprogram.org, uh, we have a whole page that lists uh, many of those resources. Uh, fingers crossed the links are, are active and working. So Great. Thank you. Yes, and please um, feel free to ask me um, for any information. I can always photocopy those um, slides that you have with the resources listed and mail them out to people. So. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you you all for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.